Welcome to China Tech Talk, the almost weekly discussion of technology and startups here in China. I am John Artman, editor in chief of Techno.com, joined as always by Matthew Brennan, founder of China Channel. So, quick warning: promos are coming up. You can skip ahead maybe two or three minutes if you if you've already heard them before. But we launched Techno Squared a couple months ago. Uh, Techno Squared is our premium membership designed for people who want to dive deep into technology in China. So we do newsletters, and、uh, we just launched our paywall as well. So、uh, any content、uh, that you find on our website that's meant for members only, well, unfortunately, you can't get to it. Unless you、uh, unless you are a member, and so we're going to be right now. We're just kind of starting off relatively slow. Only a little bit is going to be behind that paywall. But as time goes on, not only will we be putting more behind the paywall, we're also going to be looking at raising our prices. So now is a great time to get in. It's only a hundred、uh, USD per year, a little bit more than six、uh, hundred RMB for that same time frame. It's a great value. Check it out. Well, I'll put the link in the show notes and、uh, and Matt. You've got a conference coming up. I just want to say one thing about the paywall. I didn't realize you guys had a paywall until today, <laughs> and you've been very sneaky. You put in like, <laughs> there was a very enticing、uh, article: the online black market for adult content thrives behind China's <laughs> firewall. <laughs> It's like what? This looks like an interesting one, and、uh, you can't even read it unless you unless you unless you remember. You gotta be a member. Sneaked、yep. up, damn it. This could be the best article ever written, <laughs> or one of the best. No, but、uh, seriously, folks,、um, could be yeah, could be a good investment. Six hundred RMB, quite reasonable, and a lot of media are doing this now. I think like so, like pretty much all、mm-hmm. the tech media are doing this now. So、uh, yeah, it is the trend, and、uh, Technode is、uh, definitely one of the best sources. So I've got a conference, yeah, and、uh, that's coming up in September nineteenth, twentieth, China Chat. And、uh, we'll put it in the show notes. Link for that. If you're into digital marketing in China, check it out. Yeah, it's going to be great. So I missed. I went the first year. Had a lot of fun. I missed it last year, but I'm carving out time in my in my、uh, in my schedule so I can make it. I'm really looking forward to it because it's it's one of those things. I mean, like I'm not a digital marketer. I'm not a big fan of marketers in general. But、uh, but one of the things that I liked about the conference was just how much. Information there was, and so what I'm most interested in is kind of understanding what's happening, why it's happening, how 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 people are changing, how technology is affecting society and business, and so I think for, from that point of view, China Chat was、uh, was extremely extremely useful. There you go, John's got to、right. be there as well. You know, what more what more excuse do you need? None. Or <laughs> maybe we could maybe we could do None,、uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, promo over. So this week we are、uh, very happy to、uh, have back on the show Zenin、uh, Capron. So we did an episode、uh, a few weeks ago now about、uh, Libra. Facebook announced Libra, and so we did a, an episode about Libra and kind of looking at QQ Coin and kind of how QQ Coin has really kind of set. Created this this trend for virtual currency in general, and provided an interesting template for virtual currencies and how governments relate to them, and 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 how they regulate them, and and certainly in China, it's it was quite unique. But it was interesting because you know we hadn't had Zenon on since December of 2017, and he he sent us a message saying, "Hey, you know." That was a good episode, but you missed a lot, and we're like, okay, well, we need to have this guy, this guy back on. Yeah, and there's so much to talk about. I mean, like, I personally, I think Libra is really important, and、uh, is one of the big things happening in tech this year. And <laughs> we could talk about it again and again. It's、uh, for real. So, and, and Zenon's like super well placed and, and highly knowledgeable fintech guru. If you, I don't know if he'd like being called that. Maybe, <laughs> but, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm sure people have referred to him in that way because、uh, he's incredibly、uh, knowledgeable around China、uh, fintech. Exactly, and so so we talk about、uh, we talk about Libra. He、uh, elucidates some of the points that I wouldn't say that we got wrong necessarily, but、uh, adds some great detail from that discussion that we had on QQ Coin and Libra. We'll include that episode in in the show notes、uh, in case you missed it.、Uh, but then we also talk about kind of the、uh, China's plans for digital currency because as soon as an as soon as Libra is announced by Facebook, like. 
you know, a week later, there's this all out propaganda PR blitz from China and from specifically the People's Bank of China about how, you know, Libra is not that great. We're developing our own uh, digital, digital currency. So in this episode, we look, kind of look at his take on Libra and then we look at kind of uh, cryptocurrency, blockchain and digital currency as it applies to uh, China. But then, of course, we go into some other areas in terms of um, digital currencies and the financial system, the Belt and Road Initiative, and, uh, and and things like that. So it's a fascinating episode. I think it's uh, it's kind of a wide view of a lot of really interesting issues, but of course, has, as it pertains to currency and uh, and the internet. But with that, we give you Zenon Capron. Well, Zenon, thanks so much for joining us. So, uh, so, you know, you've been on the podcast before, but, uh, but in case, you know, we have some new listeners who didn't get a chance to, to listen to that episode, uh, which we will link in the show notes. Um, just, can you just give us a, a brief introduction? You know, what's your, what's your China story? Who are you and, and what are you doing? Sure. Sure. So, um, my background is pretty much completely in financial technology or, or fintech. I started off my career many years ago at Citibank in the U.S. and then worked for them for about five years in Europe. I went back to do my MBA and then I came out to China in 2004. So when I first came to China, I was working at Intel, looking after sales and marketing for the financial vertical. So basically, how did we take a Intel chip and sell it to a bank or a financial institution? And that was based out of Shanghai. They actually gave me a choice between Shanghai and Beijing. And, and in 2004, Shanghai seemed a little bit more vibrant. At the time, and um, yeah, started started my China story. Then uh, I stayed at Intel for a couple of years, and then left to set up Capron Asia, and that's uh, where I'm still working today. And the, we basically provide market intelligence and consulting services to the financial industry, so looking at trends in banking, payments, capital markets. And then, although my China story continues, I, I moved to Singapore in September of last year for personal reasons. So we still keep the office in Shanghai, but uh, now increasingly looking at what's happening in Southeast Asia in the financial industry as well. Yeah, and I think I mentioned this a few times on the podcast, but Southeast Asia is definitely an area of, of high interest. You know, people have been talking about it for a long time, uh, at least you know in, in my circles, but I feel like you know I, I haven't been there much. And, you know, I went there recently and it's clear that there's there's a lot going on and there's going to be a lot more going on in in that region. Certainly. Yeah, I think when I left China that was something I was actually a little bit worried about is it's it's difficult to match the day-to-day excitement that you have in China in terms of, you know, everything that's happening in the tech scene whether it be bike sharing or um uh, some of the big players like the Tencents and 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 financials but with so much that's happening around Southeast Asia and, and really different challenges. I mean, there's there's such a variety of countries within the region uh, and all of their challenges and regulators and everything are quite different. So there's, there's plenty to keep one busy in this area as well. Mm, yeah, I can imagine. So, uh, so for this episode, we want to talk about Libra and 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 Libra's relationship to a digital currency uh, here in China. So, we did an episode a few weeks ago on uh, Libra and in QQ Coin, kind of making some some comparisons and some contrasts between the two. There's a lot that's kind of similar, and there's a lot that's that's quite different. So I guess, you know, starting off the conversation, Zenin, what's what's your take on Libra? You know, do you think it actually has a future? Why is Facebook doing it? And and what does it mean for, you know, currency and, and transactions globally? Yeah, it's 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 a really interesting effort. And I think if anything, whether Libra succeeds or fails in in its own form, uh, the one thing it has succeeded at so far is is raising the profile and idea of a digital currency, potentially a central bank digital currency or a third party digital currency. You know, I think we've obviously had Bitcoin for a number of years, and I, I was on the podcast a couple of years ago with you guys talking about that same subject. But I think the one thing that was different with Bitcoin is that it was a very kind of esoteric topic. So you had kind of the the techno geeks and the the, the people that were a little bit off the the mainstream feel for you know what what had potential in economies around the world you know it was kind of a a niche cryptocurrency or a niche idea that people supported and there was never really the feel that it could gain mainstream acceptance but i think the big difference you know there's a lot of similarities between libra and bitcoin um, but one of the biggest differences is the potential acceptance and with facebook's 2.3 billion users in various channels across the world you know, the ability for a large swath of the population to very quickly get onto the Libra network, I think 
makes it a much more interesting value proposition. So I think it's the idea is is very interesting, and where it came from is also interesting. Obviously, uh, as you alluded to, there's what what would Facebook do is is one of the things that we're looking at, and what's in it for Facebook. I mean, it's not a company that's known for doing very altruistic activities. So we have to assume that <laughs> that's an understatement. Uh, we have to assume that at some point <laughs> on the back end, there's going to be some play in it for them. Now, the way it's structured, I mean, one of the misconceptions, and this happened in the hearings in the U.S., is that uh, there's going to be a lot of data that Facebook innately has access to. It's actually not the case. I mean, the, the, the Libra network will have access to it, but Facebook has kind of distanced itself a little bit from that. So they won't have direct access to the data, although they may through their Calibra wallet. But still, even if they don't have direct access to that, you have to figure that it f- falls into a long-term Facebook strategy. And the last point I would make on it is that, you know, I, I think it's they they kind of did themselves a disservice by going so big so quickly. I mean, if you read the white paper, it's it basically says, look, we're going to try and solve the world's financial inclusion problems. The fact that they've gone so big on that and the fact that they really haven't gotten the regulators on board before they went so big on that is either an indication that they felt that they, there was no chance that regulators would get on board or just miscalculation, because I think they would have been better served had they been a little bit more thought out on this and, you know, had the 100 players on board and had talked to a couple of regulators and had a better idea about how this was going to fit into um, markets where financial inclusion is a challenge. Well, so a a few a few reactions to uh, to what you just said. I mean, I think that that number one, you know, Facebook has a history of doing these kinds of things and just launching stuff and then kind of asking for forgiveness or trying to explain Later, I mean, you would think that they they would have learned their lesson by now, but they haven't, and so I, I do kind of wonder what what exactly is is is. I mean, if 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 they did think it through, then was it strategic not to get regulators involved? Just kind of go big, announce it, and then kind of get buy in later. But I think going back to an original point that 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 you made early on about Bitcoin versus Libra, and this is something that I mentioned in in the podcast, so I won't I won't dwell on it uh, too long in a previous episode. But I do one of the things that I'm excited about is is the possibility of some kind of widespread kind of mainstream adoption of blockchain in the consumer space. I don't necessarily think that. Facebook is the best company to do it. I'm not a big fan of them. I, I have an account, but I don't actually use their service anymore. I've been kind of watching a lot of their their struggles with quite a bit of Schadenfreude. So when it comes to the concept itself, I'm I'm very uh, enthusiastic. Uh, when it comes to the the company that's doing it, I'm very pessimistic about uh, honestly their 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 motivation in it. But at the end of the day, you know. Financial inclusion, I think, is a big issue. You know, you see in Africa, for example, mobile money is taking off because people are just unbanked, basically. And the only way to really kind of solve that is for for telecoms operators to come in and, and try to solve that issue somehow. But I've talked with with uh, blockchain companies who used blockchain and use their own token not necessarily as a way to to raise money or not not even as a way to um, Create some kind of incentive system, but literally just to pay people because what they were, what they were finding is that people who were doing tasks for them, uh, mostly kind of, um, labeling tasks and kind of around data and trying to, trying to take unstructured data and, and make it structured. A lot of these people were coming from, uh, relatively undeveloped countries and didn't have access to, uh, to the banking system. Uh, they couldn't get bank accounts. They couldn't get credit cards, and so on and so on. And so this was a Russian company. Uh, and so the best way to pay someone in Brazil or somewhere else, uh, or, or somewhere in Africa, was actually for them to make their own cryptocurrency and use that as uh, as re- uh, a remuneration uh, device, basically. And then the people could, you know, go on to an exchange and exchange that for for fiat or for for whatever they for whatever they wanted to. So the financial inclusion problem certainly is is uh, is is very relevant. But again, I I have big big questions about you know Facebook's actual motivation around this. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And and one of the things to consider in that as well is though the, on the financial inclusion aspect is that. The biggest, the biggest part of this Libra equation when it comes to financial inclusion that's not really addressed in the white paper, and, and it's something that the Libra Association has left to anybody who creates a wallet and connects into it, is, is that last mile, is, 
is how does an individual in Singapore, as an example, get their Singapore dollars into Libra and then get it to the Philippines? I mean, getting it to the Philippines is part of the network, so that's the easy part. But then for the recipient in the Philippines to be able to take it off Libra and put it into their bank account in Philippine pesos. Now, if you're staying within the network, you know, so as an example, eBay is one of the 26 or some odd um, partners that's already involved in the Libra Association. If you're selling things on eBay and you're building up, you know, a stock of Libra and you're using that to buy it and, you know, you're, you're just trading in Libra. So you're buying things in Libra, you're selling things and receiving Libra, then it's fine. But when you need to get into fiat currency, the biggest challenge around that is that if you look at most payment networks today, I mean, we think about making a, a bank transfer and a bank transfer, you know, between the sending and receiving fees can be up to $60. The actual, the amount that's involved in the network part of that, so this swift message that goes through is is cents. It's, it's not a very large amount of that $60. That $60 comes from all the banks that are sitting in the middle that are facilitating that transaction. And indeed, when you look at the credit card companies as well, they, the amount that Visa and MasterCard take is, is a few basis points. A lot of that money goes to the banks that are issuing the cards or the, the banks that are dealing with the merchant. So the big question in Libra is, is who's going to deal with those endpoints and what are they going to charge? Because 90 to 97% of all of the fees for making cross-border payments is in that endpoint. And so how that's handled could be a big part of the equation as well. And it's one of the things getting getting onto China that that and Financial and Tencent did very well with their their the QR codes is the merchant fees were very low. I mean the merchant fees were much lower than credit cards and debit cards when they were first launched. So for a merchant to adopt QR code payments, it was a very it was a no-brainer. It just made a lot of sense for them because the fees were much lower. But it remains to be seen because that that part is not defined in the Libra ecosystem how much those on and off ramps are going to cost. But also, like in terms of uh, remittance, which is kind of the the primary or, or the the first use case that they're really going at. I mean, there's already a few companies in the blockchain space trying to do that, right? Yeah, and you know, I I having been in the fintech, I think too often we get distracted by shiny objects. And so, you know, there are certain companies like TransferWise is a good example. TransferWise, as far as I'm aware, their technology is not based on blockchain. It's very, it's a very basic business model, but they, they, they manage to make money off of it. You know, they make it very cheap for businesses and consumers to send money around the world. There's no blockchain involved. It's just a very, it, it's, it's looking at the current system and, and driving efficiencies out of that. And, and in many ways, you know, Alipay and WeChat Pay are the same way. It's just looking at points of friction. There's no blockchain involved in that. So it is, I mean, it is interesting to see that, you know, Libra, although it's not traditional blockchain in terms of the model, it's more of a, instead of a chain of transactions, it's more of a snapshot. So it's easy to think about like an Excel spreadsheet is kind of Libra model. So you look at the Excel spreadsheet at any point and you look at the transactions rather than, than examining a chain. But you know, I, I think it doesn't necessarily need to be blockchain to be better. We see a lot of examples out there of, of just traditional technology that's being used in different ways um, to, to remove these points of friction. So going back to the original uh, points, I mean, like, what do you think, honestly, you know, are the chances of Libra actually going through? You know? I, as much as I would like to, and and. I, I'm, you know, I'm not a huge fan of Facebook myself. I, I've, I've tried to disconnect a little bit more from it uh, recently, and I don't have it on my phone and 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 the like. But you know, as as much as I, whether I like or dislike the company that brought it up, I think it's a really innovative idea, and I would love to see it gain adoption. But I think it's going to face a lot of challenges. You know, that one of the the amazing things about Bitcoin is that there's no central authority behind it. It's a decentralized network. But at the end of the day, Libra is centralized. I mean, there are companies that are associated with it. So the U.S. government, and we've seen this in the banking industry for many years, is that if the U.S. government wants to shut down these individual organizations or wants to cause fines, then they could do a lot to accomplish that. I mean, there was some talk that Facebook could be fined a million dollars a day if they ended up running Libra. The government could decide to do something like that, and and for a company like Facebook, that's you know in billions and billions of revenue a year, maybe that's not a huge amount of money, but it, it's still there's there's a lot of barriers that they could put in place, and that's not the case with Bitcoin because you can't you can stop one Bitcoin exchange, or as China has done, and say all of the exchanges need to leave or shut down, but you can't stop Bitcoin itself. But it, it's kind of a different story with Libra because 
the the validators in this ecosystem are all functioning companies that could that are under the purview of some government around the world. And and I just think it, Libra is going to face a lot of challenges getting around those regulatory issues. So the chances of it actually, be, you know, how could they launch? I mean, let's say they they are regulated against in some countries but not others. You know, what, what would be a realistic picture here? Of the, could it survive still? If it's just, you know, um, what what would be the minimum for it to be a success? I guess like, or how would you realistically see it playing out? Like knowing that the picture is going to be messy. Um, yeah, globally, right? The minimum, that's a good way of looking at it. I think the minimum is the U.S. I mean, the U.S. has to be okay. The U.S. government has to, and regulators need to be okay with Libra for it to have a chance of success around the world. Because I think, you know, at the end of the day, if Facebook completely pulled out of this and, and wasn't really supporting it, I don't know if the other players would have the the gumption to kind of continue the project. And so I, I think they, they need to make U.S. regulators comfortable with that. And to be able to do that, I think it, it needs to give up some of its basic characteristics. I mean, the, the U.S. government is, is not so happy with Bitcoin because it can't see who's behind the transactions. It can't have control over the transactions, whereas anything that goes through the U.S. banking system or a U.S. dollar transaction even, they have a lot more visibility into and there's a lot more transparency and control that they have. So maybe maybe the way that they that Libra is able to satisfy the U.S. government is by providing a little bit more transparency, not really a backdoor, but a little bit more visibility to the government about what's happening on the network. So yeah, uh, so I remember that you actually, you were talking a little bit uh, before we started recording about some of the things that uh, we either got wrong or uh, forgot to mention in our in our previous episode on Libra, especially Libra versus QQ coin. So for you, what were some of the things that kind of stood out from from that that you'd like to address? Well, I think the <clears throat> the biggest thing is kind of, we touched on this a little bit before, but at the end of the day, it's ten cent behind QQ coin as an example. And and yeah, I mean QQ coin was probably what was going through Satoshi Nakamoto's mind when he wrote the Bitcoin white paper is is one of the few examples of a, a virtual currency or widely used virtual currency around the world. But it is very centralized. So, you know, when Tencent produces QQ coins, they have to put it on their balance sheet. It's kind of like frequent flyer miles, you know, when when uh, China Eastern or Singapore Airlines awards frequent flyer miles to me to fly to Shanghai, you know, I get 3,000 miles. They have to account for that because at some point it, it's a liability for them because at some point I I can, you know, request a free ticket on the back of that. So much like airlines need to keep those points on their balance sheet, uh, Tencent also needs to keep QQ coins on their balance sheet. And I think they count it as deferred revenue. And at the end of the day, the Chinese government has to be happy with QQ coins. I mean, if if they really wanted to quash QQ coins, they could, because they could just go to Tencent. They could say, look, figure out a way to unwind all these QQ coins. And then Tencent would have to, in theory, go out and buy them all back from the people who have bought them. Because there there would be a you know a defined amount that's out there that that Tencent had you know, um, created at one point. And then just by the nature of that, it provides a lot more comfort for the Chinese government around the control that they have over that virtual currency. So indeed, you know, they were getting nervous that it was becoming a replacement for the B, but at the same time, it's something they can tr- control. Whereas with Bitcoin, it, it's with the capital controls that are in place, it's much more difficult for the Chinese government to control uh, people's value if it's stored in Bitcoin, because that, in theory, could be moved anywhere around the world. So I think that that nuance between the centralized and the decentralized infrastructure is really important, especially for the government's attitudes towards that, and, a, as well as their ability to react to any risks that they see coming from some of these platforms. Yeah, that's that's the thing. I mean, like I remember when when Bitcoin. Uh, I've been following Bitcoin on and off for for uh, many years now, and you know, initially I was very uh, attracted to it. You know, because a lot of it happened when uh, during the uh, quantitative easing of uh, of the United States and kind of helping. Basically, tr- the U.S. Fed, uh, Treasury and Zenin, correct me if I'm wrong, but basically, like you know, the the Fed was uh, issuing money as a way to to stave off uh, in, uh, deflation and to help boost uh, the the U.S. economy to a certain degree. And there was, I mean, so so in the kind of cryptographic circles, there was a lot of talk for a long time 
about creating some kind of crypt- cryptographically based currency. And there had been a few other other types of currencies that had been proposed, maybe even launched, but never really got any uptake. Uh, and so when Bitcoin first really got some traction, it was, you know, I think from a kind of philosophical sense, it was very attractive because you could see that the United States was literally manipulating their currency. With, with the quantitative easing. And then Bitcoin was created to be completely decentralized so that, so that it could not be manipulated by a centralized force. Now, what's interesting is, of course, that I think that inevitably governments don't like that. Uh, and so I've always been very curious as to kind of what the trajectory of Bitcoin is going to be, given the fact that it is, you know, anti-establishment or, or anti-government in a, in a certain sense. But then also you can see that actually like, the uh, Bitcoin, in a certain sense, is actually kind of centralized. I mean, classic Bitcoin diehards will probably disagree with me on this point. But when I mean, you look at mining pools and you look at who controls the mining and who controls the creation of Bitcoin, and you can see that all these different forks and things. And so clearly there is there is a way to centralize it to, to a certain degree. Whoever has the most uh, mining capability can can to in a certain extent uh, control the currency itself but it's it's really kind of interesting because i think that at the end of the day you know we should not be surprised at all uh, for example that china decided to completely ban bitcoin and and cryptocurrency you know we shouldn't be surprised at all that you know all these kyc and aml uh, regulations have come in uh, you know basic kind of financial regulations are now being applied to to cryptocurrency because the government you know they're not really going to they're not going to make it easy for people to use stuff if they don't actually know how they're using it. Yeah, indeed. And I I think a lot of those points are true, especially around the centralization aspect. I think the other thing to keep in mind as well is that we've never, we've never been in, at least in modern history, we've never had a situation where the government has not been able to control the currency. So, you know, although there are negatives for uh, all the quantitative easing that happened over the past couple of years, it did keep us in theory as a global society from going into a much deeper funk after the global financial crisis than we did already. And and so governments around the world use these tools of uh, the fiscal and monetary tools to be able to adjust the amount of currency in circulation and, and set set the tone in the stance. Interest rates, as an example, to to be able to control the economy in the best way that you know modern economic theory allows. But when you have something like Bitcoin or something that's, you know, is either deflationary or follows a different inflation path, that becomes very challenging. And and I think that's that's why the government has been a little bit anti-Bitcoin and potentially anti-Libra as well is because, you know, it, it then loses control of those levers that it has used in the past to stabilize the economy when needed or to affect change when needed. So there are there are some challenges around that. But I think, you know, when we look at the idea of central bank digital currencies, it's it's definitely something that governments are very interested in. If you look at certain places like Sweden, there's actually pushback because they've gone too digital. You know, so there's certain uh, segments of the population, not that Sweden has a large financial ex- financially excluded population, but, you know, the elder generation that's more comfortable using cash, there's actually been pushback because so many of the transactions are digital and there's so little cash left that it's becoming a problem. But governments around the world, the, the, the transparency and the control that digital currency gives, whether in a, in a semi-centralized form like an Alipay or a WeChat or a completely centralized form like a, a central bank digital currency is something that's very attractive. And, and certainly, you know, I, I think 100 years from now, if not sooner, we'll all cash will not exist and we'll be using some form of digital currency in our wallets or phones or just even embedded in ourselves to to make transactions. Uh, you know, cash will go away eventually, but it may take a couple of generations for that to comfortably happen for everybody. Yeah, so um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, centralized digital currency, but just a quick anecdote. So I was in Shanghai a couple of weeks ago, and I lost my cell phone. Uh, I lost my phone. And because my my uh, SIM card is uh, uh, a Beijing SIM card, the only way that I could get a new SIM card was to uh, come back to Beijing. And it's actually under my wife's name, and so we just had to wait like two or three days. And so the only, I mean, I was, I was in Shanghai for, for about a day and a half with no phone. And on the one hand, I didn't mind being off the grid, but on the other hand, it was super, super weird to not be able to use WeChat or or Alipay. 
Uh, I was in a car at one point in a cab. I, I could only take cabs, right? I couldn't take DD. I couldn't take uh, any any anything that required, you know, uh, mobile payment. And I was in a cab, and I actually and and you know, I said, hey, you know, I don't I don't I don't have WeChat. I lost my phone. And 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 at first, like he was just like, what? Like, are you serious? Like, you actually have cash? Like, oh god, he's not going to take cash. Oh my god, I'm screwed. Uh, it turned out fine, but it was just what it's like a day and a half, two days of not having a phone. And because in China in particular, you know, you're talking about Sweden, it really got me thinking about this. In China, everything, almost everything these days is, is mobile payments, digital payments. Cash, you know, is very, very rare, uh, at, at, at this point. And so like, you know, speaking of kind of digital currencies and, and things like that, where, in China, at least, and, and perhaps other, other places around the world, you know, the transition from, you know, an Alipay WeChat that's based on, you know, the cash I have in my bank to kind of like Alipay WeChat or whatever else based on, you know, some, some digital, digital RMB based on the blockchain that I have and which we'll, we'll talk about in a second. I think it's, is actually, it's going to be a super, super easy transition. Uh, but we can come back to this point, uh, later, I think. But this is, this is kind of the, the crux of the episode. So we've talked a little bit about, uh, Libra and kind of big, uh, blockchain and Bitcoin and kind of a bit of the, the global context around this stuff. But what's always been really fascinating to me is that even after, you know, China, they completely banned Bitcoin, banned cryptocurrency trading, banned ICOs. But the, the People's Bank of China for years now keeps saying how that they want to have their own kind of blockchain based digital currency. And so my question is, and so, you know, with, with, sorry, with the Libra announcement, so they, they, they've been silent for quite some time about this, but then with the Libra announcement, they made a lot of noise about how they want to, uh, kind of get this, get this project going and that they're going to do it and things like that. And so I guess, you know, Zenon, if you can just kind of take us back a little bit, you know, what, what, what's been the history or kind of the timeline of kind of a uh, digital currency in, in China? Yeah, and I think you you've kind of sketched it out there a bit already. Uh, but the I, after after Bitcoin really started to to grow and take hold in China, so probably 2013 2014, we we first started seeing kind of muted discussions from the government or mentions in, in particular events of somebody from the PBOC or or uh, one of the other regulators talking about the potential of the government creating a competitor to Bitcoin or or a a similar kind of model of a digital currency. And so it, it, it's certainly something that's not simplistic to do. You know, it's it's one thing when you have a um, a platform like an Alipay that's that's controlling a certain percentage of all of the money in China. You know, all, there's a certain percentage of the money that goes through the Alipay or the WeChat Pay platforms. But when you consider, when you bring that into the context of both, you know, retail transactions and business transactions and government payouts and, in monetary policy and and the fact that you know every renminbi that sits on an alipay wallet is backed up by one renminbi that's in a bank somewhere else and so the government can print more money or it can you know collect more of the money and take money off the market but with the central bank digital currency that all has, has to be handled digitally and so the the challenges around that i, I completely agree the end user adoption for most people, they probably wouldn't even notice the difference. You know, if if Alipay, if tomorrow Alipay and WeChat Pay integrated a central bank digital currency, most people wouldn't see the difference. You know, the, the front end is still the same. You're still swiping the QR code. Everything is else is happening just on the back end. And so I think that that it's it's more it's more the dynamics on the back end that are are challenging to overcome. So how do you how do you deal with those issues of of uh, monetary policy, how do you ensure the monetary supply is is neither here nor there? It's 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 really much more complicated on the back end for the government to kind of enable a system like that, and then rolling it out as well. I mean, we saw a couple of years ago when India tried to demonetize, that was the country was in shambles for a week as as banks were taking money off the market and certain bills were no longer accepted. And people were bringing money that had been hidden in mattresses into the banks just so they could get it counted. I mean, that, that, that was a big challenge. And, and it would be similarly challenging, you know, how do you transition to a central bank digital currency in a country as large as China with as many people as China? So I think certainly if we look globally at governments around the world, the Chinese government's probably further along or has at least invested the most in uh, the idea of the central bank digital currency. But then 
you know, whether they whether Libra has really pushed them to go faster or not, I think a lot of it, a lot of the rumblings that we've seen over the past couple of weeks have been a bit of a PR exercise to let the Libra Association know that, hey, you know, first of all, we're not open to Libra here in China. And second of all, we're already working on a uh, another system that would be that would accomplish the similar similar goals. So, you know, I, I think certainly the government is is working towards that end and eventually will go in that direction. But, you know, whether Libra has sped up the process or not, it could just be marketing that the government has pushed out to say, OK, we are working on this faster now. But inevitably, that's the way it's going to go, certainly in China. Interesting. So, like, just to make it clear to listeners, like, um, why would a government actually want to do this? Why would the Chinese government, what are the, like, clear advantages for going through all this effort if the experience for the end user, as, you, as we've explained, is like is not really going to change that much and everything's kind of digital already mostly. Why would you even want to do this? It's It comes down to a lot more about transparency and visibility. You know, the, the, the U.S. dollar is, is, despite all of the efforts of the U.S. government, the U.S. dollar is one of the most accepted currencies around the world. And that also is one of the primary tools for money laundering and terrorism financing is is the U.S. dollar itself. And once a, a currency is in cash, once you have, you know, a stack of 10,000 U.S. dollars, you pretty much take that anywhere in the world and get something for it. And it, it's very untraceable. You know, nobody knows that you had that particular set of bills that got you to $10,000. The renminbi is not as accepted globally, but certainly, you know, the, the government is keen to really have that level of transparency in terms of what people are doing with the money, uh, obviously because the remedy is capital controlled as well. They want to make sure that they're controlling the inflows and outflows, which they have a pretty good handle on right now. But there's still a lot of gray market activities um, that we've seen over the years, with whether it be uh, gambling in Macau or China Union Pay scams or other ways of that we've seen uh, mainly outflows. Chinese Chinese uh, individuals moving their money outside of China. But, you know, it brings more, a lot more visibility on those transactions. So I think any government around the world for the stated reasons of anti-money laundering and terrorism financing, but more tactically tax evasion and, and avoiding capital controls would be two of the bigger concerns. So I think that would provide a lot more visibility into that. It also gives them a lot more control. Uh, you know, one of the things that has been mentioned is if China moved to a central bank digital currency, so much of the Chinese economy is dictated by bank lending. So when the Chinese government loosens monetary policy, it typically is reflected in the amount of money that banks can lend out. But the government doesn't really have a good feel for how that money is being lent or uh, if it's effective when it's being lent out. So again, you know, with with a central bank digital currency that the government has complete visibility into where all of those digital RMB are, that allows them to control that much better. So it's not unlike other governments around the world. I think the you know if the U.S. government could immediately switch to a digital currency, it probably would as well uh, for many of the same reasons. So transparency for the government, but that not necessarily transparency for for everyone else, right? This would be a sort of one way transparency going up. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely takes away any uh, privacy around transactions that individuals would have. But again, you know, once we've gone digital, uh, whether it's a Visa card or an Alipay wallet or a Grab Pay here in Singapore, those transactions can be tracked very easily. So, mm, yeah. you know, we're, we're, we're already shifting away from a, a privacy focused um, currency for most most individuals these days. So it would just be another step in that direction. Yeah, I mean that was kind of the point I was getting at earlier with the with the uh, centralized clearinghouse behind all of the mobile payments in China. Now the government pretty much has insight into all of that, all of those transactions that are happening already. Um, it's really just the cash element that's sort of missing. And as you mentioned, more sort of like business to business transactions. I think that would probably be a less less clarity in that area. But there's already a lot of clarity on the consumer side. I feel certainly. But I mean, this is this is one of those things. I mean, you know, we've in the Western press, we've been hearing a lot about some of the 
the bad things that, that, that China is doing, in particular around surveillance, facial recognition, artificial intelligence, and things like that. So, I mean, you know, would a, a centralized digital currency kind of give the government more power? I mean, as you mean, I mean, I guess the, the answer is kind of yes, right? But like, is that something to be concerned about? So, so like, even on an individual level, for example, what if the government one day says, hey, you know, Ice cream is bad for you, you know, during the winter. So we're not going to allow transactions dealing, you know, people buying ice cream. I mean, I mean, obviously that's that that's a bit of a reductio ad absurdum. But it's it's it seems like with the digital currency, there is a, a bit of danger in terms of the government saying these types of transactions are are no longer legal, and then you know not not having any recourse because cash doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, and that, that's I, I think. Fortunately or unfortunately, I guess, depending on which side of the debate you're on, that's the way that we're going as a society is that the government will have a lot more control into, you know, what you do with your money and, and where that's going. I, I think one of the, the scarier and potentially more realistic ways that this could be seen is with taxes. You know, if, if you have, you know, certain countries have either devalued their currency or, uh, you know, swapped it for a different currency, like, uh, you know, the Zimbabwe dollar shifting to the U.S. dollar in, in those societies. I mean, it would be very easy for a country that is on a central bank digital currency to say, OK, look, we're having fi- fiscal trouble. You know, we're just going to take a 10 percent haircut on everybody's money. And so, you know, historically, you'd have your money in a mattress and and it couldn't really be touched. But, you know, in this case where everything is digital, if the government wanted to do that, you know, we'd have to have the faith in the governments that they wouldn't try to do something like that unless it was really the case. But, you know, you could see in certain countries, not necessarily China, but in certain countries and and potentially South America or Africa that are really struggling these days, that that could potentially happen. And that's kind of a scary, uh, a scary potential outcome of, of, of some of the ways as we shift towards digital cash. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, so how much of this is driven by competition between China and their mooring in fear of missing out where, you know, the States is going to get ahead in this area of Libra? Is that really the case that if Libra gets wide acceptance, it's going to affect the competitive dynamics here? You know, there's people talk about this. Is this really, is there really a competitive dynamic here or is this just talk from, from media essentially? I don't think it's China versus Libra. I think it's the renminbi versus the U.S. dollar. I mean, it's no secret that the, the the Chinese government has huge aspirations for the renminbi. And, you know, five years ago, you guys will remember this, the talk of the renminbi being the future trade currency and the internationalization mm. of the renminbi was everything that was being talked about. And that's kind of, although, you know, the Hong Kong, London, Toronto have emerged as renminbi trading centers or offshore renminbi centers, that transition to renminbi really hasn't happened. And and there's historical reasons for that. I mean, the fact that oil is still priced in U.S. dollars gives U.S. dollars, you know, quite a bit of strength in the U.S. government. And then the fact that U.S. government has the largest military, et cetera, et cetera, you know, all these macroeconomic reasons. But Mm. one of the aspects of Libra is that it's going to be backed by a reserve of multiple different currencies. And by any estimation, you know, 30 to 50 percent of that could potentially be the U.S. dollar. And so that would further entrench the U.S. dollar as kind of a global reserve currency and and take away the importance of the renminbi, because I think if the renminbi is part of that Libra basket, it's going to be a very small percentage as compared to the other the other currencies like the pound or the Japanese yen or the euro that might be in there. Mm. Um, So so I think it's not so much a China versus Libra, but a, a China versus U.S. dollar when we look at the competition angle of, of Libra and digital currency. Well, that's, that's kind of a point that I was going to make as well. I mean, like if, if China can develop and deliver a digital currency, uh, as well as let's, you know, a plug and play infrastructure for that, for financial centers, for other governments uh, in terms of bond trading or, or what have you, seems that actually if they can do that fast enough, then, then it's actually going to be, you know, really good for them in terms of in terms of competition against the USD. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I think we're, the, I mean, this really expands the conversation, but if you look at the Belt and Road Initiative, a significant amount of the lending that's going out through that initiative is coming from either, either Chinese institutions or multilateral institutions in China or funds that have been set up by China, like the Silk Road Fund. And a lot of that lending is in renminbi, and it's 
I mean, one of the aspects is that that uh, many of the construction companies and and infrastructure companies that are involved in BRI projects, Belt and Road projects in the destination countries, happen to be Chinese companies. So they're they're more willing to take RMB, but you know, with a lot of the funding going out as RMB, that's that's one of the stated goals of the government as well. So, you know, there's no there's no clear silver bullet for making the RMB a, a a global reserve currency on par with U.S. dollars, but the the Chinese government is doing everything it possibly can to make that happen, whether it be BRI or or central bank digital currency or setting up these reserve centers in in Hong Kong, London, Toronto. You know they're really trying hard, and they're 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 doing pretty much everything they can. There's very few very few avenues left for them to really push that forward. But I, I think certainly that is one of the big considerations. That would be one of the big considerations for the U.S. government backing Libra as well, right? In the end, uh, even if they're a little bit concerned about Facebook, you know, uh, they'd probably you know there could be just again a, a fear of like not controlling this, right? At least Facebook is is willing to. Uh, is an American company, and it's, it's. Sorry, I think I think that's that that's an argument that Facebook has been making for the last couple of years, especially mm. with more and more talk of yeah. people saying, "Hey, we should break up Google and we should break up Facebook." And they're being really smart, and they're saying, "Hey, look, if you break us up, then we're going then the U.S. is going to be less competitive globally uh, against uh, Chinese technology companies," which I think is is a really smart play on their part. Yeah, and a lot of the, I mean, the testimony over the past, the the recent Libra testimony has very much been along those lines. And when when the Libra Association went to Congress to explain what they're trying to do, they on on a couple of occasions they, they've said, "Look, show us what you want, or let's work together on this to essentially find a a common solution." I, I think the challenge for the U.S. government right now is, at least, I mean, listening to some of those hearings is kind of comical because the grasp of Technology in general. I mean, I'd love to. You guys go testify about the impact of TikTok. You know, it would be a very difficult conversation because I think the the seventy and eighty year olds that you're dealing with in Congress really don't have a clue about how some of these things are, the potential use cases or how things work. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges for Libra in the states right now is that people just assume, oh, it's Facebook. You know, it's 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 they're going to be stealing our data, which isn't necessarily the case. But I, I, I think. You know, the government must realize that it's better to be on side with this than off side with this. But I think the 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 earlier question the U.S. government is wanting to ask is, do we even want this, as, you know, at all? And then if we do, you know, what's our what's our role in that? Well, a quick a quick point about uh, about U.S. politics. My 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 take is that uh, if it's a public hearing, then it, then what we see from Congress people or senators is more about grandstanding and uh, making assurances to stakeholders or or constituents, and less about actual uh, uh, policy policy making. So, well, and so in that sense, we'll just I mean, if 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 my if my conjecture is correct, then you know a lot of the the real conversations are happening, um, you know behind closed doors in private hearings and private conversations. So we'll just, I mean, and, and it's hard for me to believe that, that U.S. policymakers are really that dumb, uh, although I can believe that some definitely are. But at the same time, you know, the, they're, po- politicians at the end of the day are, are quite pragmatic, I think, and China is a big boogeyman. And so, you know, and, and really both parties are, are kind of on board together. That's one thing they can, they can kind of agree on is that something needs to be done about China. They can't agree on what that is, but, but Libra might be, might be one, uh, might be one arrow in the quiver. Um, so I guess, you know, we're getting kind of close to time, I think, but, you know, but looking at kind of coming back to China, China's efforts, um, specifically when it comes to digital currency, I guess my big question, and I, and, and I always feel kind of dumb asking this kind of question, but like, what's the timeline for this kind of thing? You know, what, what, when can we actually expect something like this, some kind of, you know, digital fiat currency to actually become reality? Yeah, and and that's the the million dollar or million libra question, as, as the case may be. I, I think you know, from my own personal perspective, I think within three to five years, we'll we'll definitely see pilots of, and that's probably being very conservative. I, I think it'll probably happen before that, but at least within three to five years, we'll see some pilots of central bank digital currency in China of some sort, it will take longer to roll it out. You know, I think the, the first use cases will be in controlled environments. So the my understanding is the tests that have happened so far have been 
like for bank to bank transfers or within the financial system. So it doesn't actually touch uh, consumers or companies, but it's just between banks as a way of uh, providing settlements. And so it'll probably start there. And we may not even know that it's happening. I mean, that, that may just happen privately uh, without much public uh, attention or awareness. But then it gradually it'll roll out to, I would assume, businesses next because the government has a little bit more control over the businesses. And obviously there's fewer than people. And then, you know, the retail element will come in after that. So I, I would I would say that, you know, we'll see a lot more action over the next uh, three to five years. And I would say within 10 years, uh, China will be uh, on a central bank digital currency. That's not to say that cash will be completely gone in China at that point, but I, I think the usage will be will drop significantly uh, of cash in that time period. Yeah, because you still have the same issues around exclusion of people are less educated or less technologically savvy, right? I mean, that's there's, there's, there's the same issue with mobile payments. Uh, it's still going to be here. I don't think you can completely eradicate cash, right? We never know. I, you know, I, I completely agree with you, Matt. You know, I, I think there's there's a lot of people that, you know, I, I think from my parents, I mean, they're very comfortable using credit cards and they've almost transitioned from cash. They use credit cards for most transactions because it's very easy and it's very kind of easy to understand. But you know, certainly, uh, you know, neither one of my parents have have bought Bitcoin or, you know, moved Bitcoin around that that's kind of a level beyond. And, and so I think, you know, there is there is even even when we look at things like Alipay and WeChat Pay, there is a certain segment of society that is not comfortable with that for whatever reason. And so cash will still have a role. But I think eventually, uh, you know, as as the current generations grow up using digital cash, I think eventually cash will, will become a thing of the past and, and we will be digital digital currency of some sort in the future. All right. Well great. Well Zenin, thanks again for, for coming on for this for the second time. Really, really appreciate it. Great, great conversation. Certainly I, I learned a lot. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, and so so before we before we do end, just very quickly, if people want to find you online, where where can they do that? Sure. Well, our company website is uh, just Capron Asia, K-A-P-R-O-N Asia dot com. And you can find me on Twitter at Zenon Capron. And uh, my my WeChat is just Zenon. Perfect. And to uh, to our listeners, if you enjoyed this episode, we really appreciate it if you gave us a review on iTunes. It really helps that SEO juice to get more more listeners and to expand our community. If you are on Pocket Cast or Overcast, you can uh, just tap on that star button, and it will recommend this episode to your network. 